morning, Chicago. Good afternoon, Switzerland. It is with great pleasure that I welcome all of you who are tuned in to our virtual meeting of two of the world's leading financial centers, Switzerland and Chicago, discussing future challenges and opportunities in a fast shifting and evolving sector of our economies. What has started in Chicago in 1898 with the butter and egg board laid the groundwork for the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and the Chicago Board of Trade, pioneers and still world leaders in futures and options. In Switzerland, the first public banks have been established in the 15th century. The industrialization required a strong and solid banking sector, which gained international importance and reputation thanks to the stable and secure political environment in neutral Switzerland. Some of the world's leading banks and insurance companies have its origin and headquarters in Switzerland. And this has certainly been an important contributor in establishing Switzerland as the world's center of commodity trading. Throughout the past decade, Switzerland has always ranked and continues to rank amongst the top three most innovative and competitive countries in the world. Science, economy and government work hand in hand in an environment traditionally marked by stability, security and trust in order to create the, fer the fertile grounds for new innovations in fintech and sustainable finance. This rapidly evolving technology requires an agile legal framework to create the conditions in which novel technologies can thrive whilst reducing the risk of abuse or fraud. The Swiss government has been the first in adapting federal laws, removing unjust unjustified barriers to market entry and create a secure legal basis in order to promote the FinTech and blockchain ecosystem, which is flourishing. Sustainability presents a considerable opportunity and the fast pace of digitalization in all sectors of the economy is opening up new opportunities and accelerating structural shifts. A dynamic fintech system significantly enhances the quality and competitiveness of the Swiss financial center. With regard to blockchain, it has been crucial for the Swiss government and legislators to strike a balance and create a legal framework which enables rather than impedes innovation so that the potential of new technologies can be fully realized. At the, Swiss, at the same time, Switzerland's integrity and good reputation as a first-class business location must be protected in all areas. Well, I'm very much looking forward to today's discussion and my gratitude goes to our friends at World Business Chicago for the excellent cooperation in the preparation of this discussion. I thank Randy Rivera for moderating the discussion and the panel participants Brian Barnes and Joe Holberg from Chicago, as well as Ilya Volkov and Daniel Hauenschild from Switzerland for sharing their insights. It's time, however, to hear now from our partners from Chicago. And it is my pleasure to hand over to Michael Fasnacht, Chief Marketing Officer and Interim President and CEO of World Business Chicago. Thank you, Michael. The floor is yours. Thank you, Consul. And good morning and good afternoon to both our friends in Switzerland and here in Chicagoland. Uh, liebe Grüße an die Schweiz. Freut mich, dass so viele von euch dabei sind. Please allow me a few words why it's really so great to be here today to talk about the future of global finances. Chicago is truly the nucleus of fintech activity in the Midwest. Some of the leading global financial institutions and commodities exchanges are here in Chicago, including BMO Harris, Northern Trust, Chicago Board of Trade, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Chicago Board of Option Exchange, Citadel, Discover, so many more. We are really the second largest central business district in America and home to the Chicago Stock Exchange in eight Fortune 1000 financial services company. 6% of our workforce here in Chicago work in the financial ecosystem. 
we're so thrilled to have partnered with Switzerland and so many of his great institutions for many, many years. It's really, Switzerland is one of our oldest international strongest trade and investment partner with much of Switzerland's investment in Chicago really focusing on the financial sector. It's great then you look back that the Swiss consulate was established in 1864. It was treaty that likes to claim to be the first consulate in Chicago, and we do agree. Switzerland is a major area investor. There are nearly 100 Switzerland-based companies with over 250 locations. Companies like Zurich Financial, ABN Amri Investment, ADECO, Credit Suisse, Swiss Re, and UBS. We would love to have more of the great Swiss companies here in Chicago. Before I introduce our moderator, and he will introduce the panel, we highlight three great and very recent innovation success stories from the financial fintech sector here in Chicago. First, Tasty Trade. A Chicago fintech startup was agreed to be acquired by IG Group just last week for over a billion dollars. It was a beautiful unicorn accent. It made it even sweeter to have one of our, my good friends who was the CEO of this firm. So one of the few uh, female-led unicorns that got acquired. Second, Infusion. Infusion LLC is a startup that specialized in software for asset managers. It just got refinanced the great uh, influx of cash with a valuation of close to $2 billion. And last but not least, Opportunity Financial, which is a fintech that partners with banks to offer loans to consumers with low credit scores. These three examples show that we really are thriving innovation fintech sector here in Chicago. We want to further elevate and accelerate this. We are looking forward to continuing the collaboration between Chicago and Switzerland and continuing to build more and more relationships. It's now my great honor to introduce today's moderator, Mr. Randy Rivera, the ED Executive Director of FinTechs. Randy, up to you. Well, thank you very much for that warm introduction, Michael. And thank you to the Honorable Council General, um, World Business Chicago, and the amazing, uh, both the team that put this together today and the, the panelists that we have that we're gonna be able to get to uh, jump into today and get to know more about. The themes are collaboration and, um, and innovation. And we have a terrific group of experienced professionals here from both Chicago and Switzerland where we can uh, foster dialogue around one, uh, where we can learn from each other. Uh, two, uh, idea eight, think about ways that we can work together a little bit more. And then lastly, <clears throat> really make sure that we're capitalizing on that which makes our relationship special, which is the history and um, uh, the history of the two cities uh, and our consistent, consistent work, work, working together to bring technology to the forefront. Uh, as Michael alluded to, we have terrific stories here. Uh, it's great to hear FinTech members. FinTech is a nonprofit trade association focused on calling attention to many of the companies and the work that's being done around financial innovation and technology here in the Midwest. Um, but that's not why you logged on here today to hear about me or our organization. It's really to talk to hear from our panelists today. So what I'd like to do uh, is to do a quick round robin of our panelists and have them give us a brief introduction of who they are and what their companies do. And so we'll start uh, in the spirit of reaching across, across, the, uh, across the ocean uh, with uh, Ilya Volkup. Yeah, thank you, Randy. Uh, hello, everyone. So my name is Ilya Volkov. I'm a CEO and co-founder of UHODLER, a fintech platform based in uh, Lausanne in Switzerland. Um, so what we're doing, so basically we're making bridges between crypto and fiat. So we, we are making crypto work for you. We are making crypto uh, available for everyone. So we have all major blockchains integrated into the platform as well as all major fiat traditional payment systems integrated. So we have a number of services uh, you know, such as uh, crypto back lending, some trading solutions, uh, crypto interest accounts and, and some others. So yeah, so we're FinTech platform based in Switzerland. Great, thank you very much, Ilya. Uh, we'll turn it over now to Daniel Hodenschild who I apologize if my, uh, my, my pronunciation of the name doesn't do it justice, but uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your current role, role and what the Crypto Valley Association is about. Yeah, thanks a lot. Fantastic. Um, 
And really thanks for, for uh, moderating this panel and thank you uh, for the Council General to introduce us. Uh, it was interesting to hear eggs and butter um, talked about in the egg and butter board because I often think about uh, this as ingredients. Um, so for my sins, I'm uh, the president of the, of the board of the Crypto Valley Association. Um, we're probably one of the oldest ecosystems in blockchain and Bitcoin uh, globally. And um, we have over seven or 8,000 members uh, in our broader membership and uh, all from all over the world. And basically anybody who's ever stumbled across crypto since before ICO days till now, um, has come across us at some point in time. Um, they mostly come for the t-shirts, um, but they stay because um, of the content and some of the, some of the um, input we put out um, around um, you know, how to do business in, in digital assets. And, and, uh, um, and it's really great um, you know, to be talking uh, here today with, with Chicago, uh, you know, one of the leaders financially globally. Um, uh, and it's uh, you know, great to see also the topic of uh, digital assets and crypto uh, on the table. Well, thanks, Daniel. I know that in the Chicago market, we have plenty of companies that are uh, that have been uh, rooted in uh, the work that's being done around cryptocurrency and blockchain. Um, but with that, I'll segue to our uh, our more uh, my more local neighbors, uh, the companies out of Chicago, um, and Brian Brian Barnes from N One Finance. Uh, proud to say, we've known FinTech has known your company for quite a bit. Sometimes we've been uh, super big fans. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you've done and um, you know, how you've been involved. Yeah, for sure. So uh, good to meet everyone. I'm Brian Barnes. I'm the founder and CEO of M1 Finance. The company is a little more than five years old and we've been public facing for the last four years. Uh, what we do is we offer a retail personal finance platform that combines investing, borrowing, and spending into one comprehensive uh, digital finance platform. Our main products are M1 Invest, which is free automated investing in a custom stock or ETF portfolio. We have M1 Borrow, which is lets you borrow against your investment portfolio at rates as low as 2%. And we have M1 Spend, which is an integrated high yield checking account that gives you high interest on your cash as well as cash back through an M1 issued debit card. And it all works together so that you can automate your personalized financial plan. Uh, the company ha manages a little over three and a half billion dollars on behalf of about half a million users. Uh, those numbers have quadrupled in the last year. And so we are you know, quite a, a fast growing startup and we have 150 people based in Chicago and have raised a little bit north of $100 million of venture financing. All right. Tremendous story, Brian. And, and uh, now I'll turn it over to Joe. Uh, I remember meeting Joe when uh, he was first starting to map out uh, the concept of Holberg Financial uh, Joe, maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, you and how you came about with uh, coming, dreaming up of Holbrook Financial and what you're doing today. Sure. Thanks for uh, the quick introduction. Um, and as context, I would say we're slightly behind Brian in the startup space, uh, growing quickly as well through COVID. We've doubled in size in the last year. Uh, really what the impetus for Holbrook Financial was, I was sitting at Google across the lunchroom table from some of the smartest people I'd ever worked with and they didn't know what a 401k was. Uh, and so what I did is I left, I started Holberg Financial and we're now the top rated financial wellness benefit that companies offer to their employees to help them understand and really get a foothold with their financial wellness and security so that they can become uh, really strong uh, users of platforms like M1. So a little bit of the history and the origin there. Very helpful, Joe. Um, so at this point, I'd like to turn it over to some of the nuance about the markets that we're in. And I'll start with our, our friends over in Switzerland. Um, Daniel and, and uh, Ilya, can you maybe share a little bit about what makes your market uniquely uh, positioned or special enough for your space? I know in the crypto space, it is a very a highly popular, very headline grabbing um, sector right now. But you're both, uh, you know, there's, there's some advantages to you being in Switzerland. Can you share a little bit about how that's played out in your respective uh, roles? Yeah, Ilya, do you want to go first? Yeah, go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I think um, 
I don't know if anybody's familiar with top shots, right? But, uh, you, you know, in Chicago, you have some pretty good basketball, right? And uh, and top shots is a recent example of uh, how digital assets are starting to make their way into um, mainstream, um, you know, publications that it really even affects the man on the street. I think what you have there is uh, something called an NFT, a non-fungible token, where individual shots are, are kind of uh, given out to collectors and that becomes their digital property. Um, this opens up a completely different way that uh, business is used to dealing with the consumer um, for assets. Um, you know, you don't have to go through a media broker. You can own, um, you know, uh, your favorite shots uh, as a collectible, um, almost like collectible baseball cards uh, directly from um, the, the artists that create them uh, to, to, to the consumers. Um, and that's, that's, that's wonderful. And it, to get to that kind of space, you need to have, you know, a few things. Yeah. You need to have a regulation that's really open, um, great talent locally uh, in a fertile ground um, and, uh, and uh, you know, and, and a willingness to innovate and try new things. And, and I think that that's, uh, you know, from my experience with Chicago and Switzerland, that's, that's sort of the ingredients that we have here, uh, which makes it a really fertile ground for, for new endeavors. Yeah, so, uh, you know, in general, our markets, I mean, crypto and distributed logic technologies, innovative by nature, right? I always say that uh, if you work with, with blockchain and crypto, you don't need TV shows. So you don't need Netflix, right? Because every day brings something new and exciting. So um, here is just a brief list of innovations we've got from blockchain during the last few months. So first, uh, DeFi applications, de decentralized finance applications, uh, central bank digital currencies, CBDCs. By the way, CBDC is a really hot topic uh, in Europe and especially in, in Switzerland. So NFT mentioned by, by Daniel, and in general, you know, the growing role of retail investors. So before finance and investing was always synonymous with giant global corporations, right? But now we're we seeing investing communities spreading out all over the world, thanks to cryptocurrency and social media. So no longer limited uh, to just the stock markets on Wall Street. So but blockchain slowly, but, but surely comes uh, to many spheres of our life, especially in financial area. For example, yesterday here in Switzerland, I was offered to pay for my Swiss medical insurance in crypto. So it's really very nice, very good step, step forward uh, and very nice innovation because it makes our life easier. So uh, it's like, you know, with, with hybrid cars where gasoline and the diesel work together with the green electric energy, crypto already works together with fiat. So and that, that's great. So blockchain is now at the forefront of, of technology and I believe here in Chicago and everywhere. Ilya and Daniel, one of the things that I've learned uh, is very similar is that, or it's, it's a theme around the world, but history matters. And Switzerland has a long history of being involved in financial markets. I'm curious how you see that um, deep root history and of, of uh, Switzerland's role in the financial markets carry out as they've embraced or touched on some of these new technologies that um, are really trying to change and disrupt their respective industries. What makes it unique about the culture of the uh, finance professional in your in Switzerland uh, that makes that a better opportunity or more unique? Well, it's. I mean, I guess you could you could start by saying one, it's important, right? It's important to Switzerland um, uh, to stay at the forefront. You know, a good segment of our GDP comes from financial services institution. We've got a four trillion dollar wealth and asset management come. Um, institution and, and I think that uh, history is also important if you there's a map that I saw at some point of a, a Japanese uh, traveler that saw Switzerland somewhere back in the 1700s and it was basically you know just flat Europe and then a whole bunch of really spiky mountains and that was Switzerland in the middle right and I think that you know that geography has helped to get, you know keep Switzerland uh, a safe haven for assets globally um, as well as its open political and regulatory nature right Right. Um, being neutral, um, you know, is a, is a, you know is is a is a good way to be um, in in global financial services, and so um, that importance brings it right up to the top. And and I think that uh, in some ways, um, you know, our regulatory bodies are even 
more advanced than uh, the businesses that they regulate. Um, and they say that, you know, these old laws from 1700 and something, uh, they don't work anymore in today's day and age. We really need to think them. Um, and they come up with proposals and panels where, um, you know, people discuss these things and, and take a proactive view to changing them. And, and that, that's really kind of driven things. Um, long before kind of even, unfortunately, some of the bigger businesses um, that are stuck in the legacy framework and maybe still shaky a bit from the global financial crisis, uh, you know, have gone around and completely digitized themselves. Um, at least the groundwork is cleared in the regulatory space, um, you know, to have uh, the framework to on which to build um, and, and invest without risk. Very fascinating. Ilya, what's your perspective as a founder, someone who's, you know, runs a company? <laughs> Uh, in general, I don't don't look uh, at crypto like uh, on, on some kind of a revolution. So in my mind, crypto is not a revolution. Crypto is just an evolution. It's an evolutionary step in the development of the financial market and uh, not on the financial market, of course. So and speaking about Switzerland, uh, Switzerland has a lot of great examples of utilization of uh, crypto benefits in two different industries. Uh, look, coming back to this example uh, with insurance, so nothing changed with, with insurance. Um, uh, uh, it's just the same insurance, but now it's, uh, it's accepting payments in crypto. So another example, we, we see more and more traditional legacy banks uh, who are keep working as a traditional banks, but they are starting to work with crypto. So um, as for other benefits of blockchain, I, be, I believe that uh, um, we will uh, see more and more examples of utilization of blockchain technologies in, in many different areas, in logistics, in, in you know, uh, transport, and uh, so uh, in many different areas. But again, it's not a revolution, it's, it's an evolution. And I think uh, Switzerland is very good in implementation and integration of uh, even some, some crazy ideas, innovative ideas into traditional world. So. It's not a disruption. It's just, right. you know, organic step forward. Well, I'm going to take that and borrow it, Ilya, because I think it's a great segue into, uh, I think, the Chicago market. And um, Brian uh, and and Joe, if you don't mind, I'll pull you in. Uh, I'd love to get your thoughts because uh, Chicago is a market steeped in history, um, obviously, with what we have in terms of a trading industry that's been uh, a global leader for so long. But you're both in markets or businesses that are not in trading. Not, well, Brian, you are uh, in tra a different form of trading platform than uh, we've envisioned in the past. Can you maybe, Brian, I'd love to uh, start with you and then I get to Joe. Can you talk to me? Because it sounds like, I mean, we all know there were, there have been a lot of headlines in your industry, particularly in the online trading space uh, the last few days. So I promise not to make that a headache But uh, on this conversation. But I will point to it as, you know, in taking it, the conversation around innovation and talking about evolution, I mean, what made Chicago, for your in your case, a, a sound place to, to grow and have that conversation around how to build that, build them one? Yeah, so I think when you're talking about fintech or personal finance, you really have two components of the business. the The first is really just the consumer nature of the application that much like every consumer application out there, you're trying to go to the individual consumer, you're trying to fulfill their needs, you're trying to solve a big need that they have in their life, and you're trying to do it in a very compelling way, whether that's easy user experience, low cost, like more intuitive and the like, having it be seamless in the background of your life. And so there's an entire consumer application aspect of, of things. And then there's the, the finance part. Um, and in the, the US and Chicago, we operate in a heavily regulated environment. You're dealing with complex systems. The sort of redundancy and fail safe measures that you need to have are significantly higher than you need in a uh, consumer application. But I, I joke that it doesn't even matter if we credit a penny that someone doesn't deserve, you know, even if they get more money, the trust is gone. You really do have to, to right. operate at a higher bar and a, a level of perfection. And I think, you know, uh, Chicago offers both of that. I mean, they have a, a rich consumer facing history. I mean, e even just going back to, you know, Sears and, and Macy's and, and the like, you know, just delivering immense value to the, the retail consumer. And then, you know, like a lot of people on the, the call have mentioned, the finance industry is incredibly strong that, you know, they deal in heavily 
complex structured products, whether it's commodities, derivatives, uh, options, there's a lot of innovative brokerages in the space. And so you get a like perfect blend of the two that really create for a unique environment to create a company like M1. Very neat. And then to transition to you, Joe, you're broader in terms of what you touch because I mean, education is a big a component of what your business is rooted on. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about how the diversification or the diverse nature of our, our local uh, financial service market has helped you as you planned and designed your company? Sure. Yeah, I think some of the unique attributes of Chicago in particular that really lend themselves to such strong consumer and business uh, companies like like ours is, you know, you, you have the nexus of really strong technical talent and finance talent. And the finance talent runs up and down the experience ladder where you have entry level uh, analysts that are getting their feet wet, you know, first jobs out of college all the way up to, uh, in our case, as a venture back company, you have a lot of finance professionals that cut their teeth on the, the trading floor when that was still a thing uh, that are now turning around and being advisors and mentors uh, to building finance companies. As, as we think about what we're trying to achieve related to engaging uh, the user base that we do, we're trying to broaden and democratize access to financial knowledge so that they can, so individuals can grow into a high level of awareness and sophistication so that they are becoming increasingly ready to take on more complex financial tools and investments, whether it's the M1 platform or uh, even dabbling into something like crypto without that consumer protection and that consumer knowledge that can emanate from a place like Chicago, it makes it really difficult to engage the millions of Americans and then globally, the increasing billions of people that are coming into the middle class. This is an opportunity to really accelerate and educate people that we can do from Chicago. So Brian, uh, building on, on that, can you share a little bit about what you've learned internationally? So I know that we obviously focus a lot on our local markets and the markets that we have ahead of us. But as you as you plan through, uh, you know, the future of M1 finance, um, what did markets when you looked across places like markets like the Switzerland and um, around the world? Where did you set, where did you find opportunities to incorporate some of those learnings into your your, your planning? Because I think that's one of the things that makes the Chicago market uniquely strong is that we have ties around the world. I'm curious how you were able to take advantage of that as it one. Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, I think managing your own personal finances is sort of a universal need, whether you're in the United States or globally. And people do have the same principal uh, needs in managing their finances. They need great intuitive, low cost ways to invest their money. They need easy, low cost access to credit or borrowing funds. They need easy payment rails and the ability to, to store cash and the like. And so, you know, it's not a unique problem in the, the United States. It's, it is very much a, a global one. And everything that I hear globally is the rest of the world has a lot better than the, the United States that whether it's across all of Europe um, and the, the banking solutions, the more modern applications that they have, um, you know, whether it's in the uh, like Asia region with Alipay or WeChat, people just are innovating and delivering tools to, to manage your finances that are more akin to the what you would build if you had the 2020 version of these platforms, as opposed to the 1960s, 1970s, and sort of evolved out of that. Um, so we, we take a lot of inspiration from a product standpoint, from the, the tools that are around the world. Um, the, the one thing that I would say is, is relatively tough is just the, uh, each local environment has its own regulatory environment, as well as sort of financial infrastructure rails. And so it, it does make it tough to sort of move locations, but we do, uh, whether it's copy or steal, uh, some we do take inspiration from tools that exist outside our, our locale. And Joe, what you, is, can you talk to any examples around the world that you've picked on and kind of built upon as you looked at planning through this, the products you're designing for Holberg? Uh, yeah, I think one of the interesting things, and this was already brought up both on the Switzerland and the United States side is, you know, as, as a investment advisor, you, you are operating in a highly regulated uh, space in the United States. And so I think it, as we look at, you know, building a, a platform that speaks to a wide array 
of individuals, we have to be super cautious about uh, trying to reinvent the wheel um, versus creating new products that really speak to consumers from a behavior change perspective. Um, and some of those tools that have been built globally uh, have not gotten results for individual uh, people. And so one of the things that we really like to do is think about how it actually drives impact. And there are some great examples of how Europe is doing better than we are. Um, and then there's some really great examples, even, you know, inside of the United States on the consumer side, where you're like, wow, you know, these platforms are super engaging and as, as a B2B software, you know, we don't have to recreate something. <clears throat> because, um, it already had existed. Great. Um, so I'm going to switch back to Europe a little bit here. Daniel Ilya, one of the things that is obviously you referenced is the reputation that you're uh, markets have around the world is just being um, deeply rooted in driving markets um, and being a financial center. Uh, I'm curious from your perspective, how has you, your location, um, not just physical location, but your just uh, presence in Europe uh, proved to be an advantage, Daniel, in the sense of your specific network um, and Ilya as you've uh, grown uh, the business? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um... You know, in, with, with Switzerland, we we don't have a 300 million market with um, you know no trade barriers and uh, uh, and sort of single logistic services. So we're we're very used to um, the services that ex that go outside of Switzerland to be global uh, right away from the beginning. Um, and I think uh, you know I couldn't underscore the the sentiment as much is that. Um, as much as financial services can be different in country to country, um, you know, we think of Japan, we think of Hong Kong, we think of, um, um, you know, Indonesia, uh, South Africa, all these different places that are so fundamentally different. We're struggling through the same kind of layer of evolution in financial services altogether, right? We're all getting rid of the bank uh, and the bank branch as being something that we interact with our finances, right? This this dinosaur is 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 on is dying and uh, um, it's doing so all over. And as, as you know, at the same time, these new innovative services that are kind of very deeply linked to um, the internet and the web, uh, almost like um, uh, companions um, that you have in your everyday life, not something you go into in a physical location, but but somebody to keep you safe, um, guard your money and, and protect you from, from unnecessary expenses. You know, um, That's the shape that the new banks are taking in the new financial services. So while the whole world is different, you know, um, at the same time, we're kind of evolving at the same time. And, and, and Switzerland has this beautiful optic of being right in the middle, right? We can, we can kind of uh, see the East and we can see the West and the North and the South. And uh, I think that, that is uniquely, and we have a very open, we have to have a very open world view unless you're in the cheese or chocolate business in Switzerland, you know, you, you, your, your market is outside, even, even in the cheese and chocolate business, arguably. Ilya? Yeah. I fully agree with Daniel. So uh, Switzerland is a really good place to be to be global. So uh, because of um, great ecosystem, great uh, environment, uh, great infrastructure, rational, smart regulation, uh, access to the beautiful nature, so the quality of life in general. Uh, you know, our market um, uh, operates globally. So we work globally. So um, global market never sleeps. So it operates 24 seven, uh, 365 uh, days a year. So that's why we, we, we have to be global. We have to work uh, 24 seven on the global scale, right? Um, um, you know, if before uh, there were some concentration around financial centers like New York City, like London, like, like Frankfurt, Singapore, Moscow, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now because of pandemic, and more people working remotely, we see some kind of a centrifugal trend, right? And uh, the positive outcome from that is that even with closed borders because of pandemic, uh, we got a chance to work truly globally with many different people from many different locations. So uh, that means that being a Swiss company, we can easily work with uh, teammates in Chicago, for example, why not? So there are a lot of talents in Chicago, a lot of talented engineers and blockchain engineers. So and uh, we can easily work with them. And actually we do. So we have our team distributed, uh, remote team in, in different countries, in different locations. But as, as a base, again, Switzerland is, is a really good place uh, to, to be global. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a great, um, great point, a great place to, to build on. You know, I'd love to kind of go through and with all everyone on the panel, opening it up to, you know, 
how do we increase participation and collaboration across our markets? Um, as, as you guys know, again, you alluded to a lot of opportunities to partner with the Chicago and the crypto side. Brian and Joe have talked about how we look internationally for best practices. Um, I'll open it up to the group and anyone who wants to take a crack at that, what can we do to increase collaboration and partnership across our ecosystem? Well, what, what is, I think, just to be to be active, right? I mean, uh, re reach out. I think uh, we've got lots of landing lights here, um, uh, you know, for, for startups, for incubators, for global corporations who want to uh, uh, and express an interest. And, uh, you know, there's uh, um, lots of companies that are here to help you and organizations that are here to help you inform you if Switzerland is interesting. Um, and that's that's got to be the first step is, is, is interest in action. And then uh, you can see if it's the right move. But there's definitely lots of information and you know, bodies that can help you, um, you know, once you pick up the phone or, or, or dial uh, or click on the, the link. Yeah, you know, to, to echo that point, I think exposure is absolutely massive that I think people tend to be relatively insular. It's where you live. It's the locale that you operate in. There's probably some general local pride and the like. Um, but I mean, you know, you, like I was talking about with best practices after this call, I'm actually about to hop on a call with Temenos, a Switzerland based company for a overview of their core. And it's something that I think US centric banking models has been focused on the legacy players that are here. And it, it was, you know, it's not until you get exposure that, hey, there's this, you know, giant world of innovative companies globally. And, and now that we've moved into a more global digital base work from anywhere environment, you can have as easy exposure to those, uh, those companies, but you really do have to get the, the initial exposure, which I actually think is, is more difficult. So I think, uh, you know, getting people to, to travel more, see the companies, interact with the, the different products is, is really the uh, way to just open people's eyes and have innovative solutions come out of it. I think that's the beauty of conversations like these, where we have uh, folks from even different, different, while we're all generally involved with FinTech, there's different sub uh, verticals that we get to collaborate and learn from. I think that's a really good point. Um, one, of the, one of the things we talked about across the board was talent. And um, I'm curious if you, as you've looked at your teams and built out your teams, um, how does having an international partner or resources like the Consul General, Consul General or World of Chicago, how have you and your, your teams been able to maximize on those resources for uh, either the attraction of talent or the maximization of talent in your organizations? So we have, Really exciting market um, at the forefront of the technology, right? Uh, we have really interesting and growing business, um, uh, attractive to talented uh, engineers, business developers, and, uh, and uh, we operate globally again. So that's why we need uh, uh, some talents to, to drive our technology. Uh, and we need some talented business developers uh, with focus on different regions, different countries, different regions. So, and uh, we can offer, um, you know, perfect opportunities just because of, uh, you know, the, the nature of our market. So. Very helpful. Um, I'll add just a touch there. Uh, you know, I, I think the, not to hammer on COVID, but, uh, you know, there, there's really two sort of very obvious trends as it relates to talent. One is remote work, uh, which everyone is now familiar with. Uh, but I think the second dimension to remote work um, that is a, a little less obvious is the fact that really as, as companies and as innovators in the finance space and beyond, we, we have to think about uh, geographically agnostic talent. And so, you know, you may need a very specific type of engineer that is not in Chicago, that's not in the United States, but might be in Switzerland. Uh, and, and that is the global reality uh, that I think we need to start getting more accustomed to as it relates to virtual collaboration. Um, and part of that, going back to the first part in this conversation, it's totally about awareness and access to each other, whether it's through Crypto Valley, uh, that's more formal or less formal on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. like that. The talent opportunity is is truly global at this point. Yeah, 
I think that opportunities like this where we get to know each other flattens um, flattens the world a little bit for us, which I think is even better, makes things even easier to do that collaboration. So it's about nine ten, um, and I want to encourage. We still have a very active and robust uh, list of participants, um, which is really exciting to see. Uh, encourage everyone to take a moment and uh, share questions and ask questions. I'm monitoring the chat. Make sure we do that. Um, in the meantime, maybe we can do a quick rapid fire round um, question here or, or rapid fire session where I ask all of you, if you could tell me uh, in your specific business and your specific industry, what is the one trend that uh, has got caught your attention or has the primary spot uh, in terms of the planning that you're doing for your organization? Uh, Brian, I hate to put you on in the hot seat, but we'll st can we start with you? Yeah, for sure. So um, I think that the personal finance sector over the last I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years has gone from an unbundling of fintech solutions sort of do a point solution of the bank, where the bank used to be this supermarket of products and features that you could do anything with, but they sort of had mediocre products across the board. Um, so you got sort of movement to best in class point solutions. And I think you're moving back to a rebundling. Uh, but the rebundling, the sort of difference is it's not just same pro like different products under the same brand umbrella, they work together synergistically. And so that the whole platform is greater than the sum of the parts. And so I think it's a, there's been a trend of unbundling and then you have a trend back to rebundling of financial services. Okay, Joe? Yeah, I think, I think the trend from our perspective as a financial wellness benefit uh, is this, this notion of democratizing uh, a space that given the long history of finance has sort of had a top down approach. Um, I think we're getting into a space where the end individual is truly much more empowered in part by uh, these platforms that are aggregating uh, products and services. But as we look at, you know, what has happened not only in the great recession with the economic downturn globally, but in the last year, financial security is something that billions of people across the world do not have. Uh, and I think as, as a global population, we have to think about what we actually want people to uh, have as it relates to financial capacity. And there's just a incredible opportunity to widen the net to bring more people into the traditional financial uh, system across the world. Great. So from Brian, we got the impact of new innovation and technology on, on, on tools that individuals use to manage money. Joe's uh, talking about the uh, even more so uh, standing out. This, is, this financial wellness is a, as an important issue. Ilya, what are your thoughts? What's a big trend that keeps yeah. you? Yeah, um, the biggest trend is, is the growing role of uh, retail investors. So, and you know, the, the proper and efficient integration of uh, blockchain advantages into the personal finance industry. Uh, here is something that, that boils my blood. So it's, it's really big industry, big opportunity. So again, it's, 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 uh, again, it's not a revolution. It, it's a, a big step in, in, on the way of very uh, progressive evolution. So evolution of finance, of course. Daniel? You're on mute, Daniel, sorry. All right, so I hate to be fundamentalist about this, but I'm just gonna say it's the Bitcoin price. Um, I mean, uh, you know, when I got into Bitcoin, the price was like three or $400. Um, you couldn't chase people down the street with it, right? <laughs> you just take this, they didn't, they didn't want to hear anything, you know? And uh, now it's a 40,000, you know, everybody's kind of showing up wanting some. It's really, uh, it's kind of, um, it's, it's, it's the, the other way, you know, the heart, uh, the cart in front of the horse. But I think in general, what, what, it, what it symbolizes is an, an acceptance of, um, you know, that, that there's a, a different way coming of, of how to recognize wealth and, and ownership um, of asset classes. And I think that's really um, this switch, uh, waiting for this penny to drop. Um, it seems that we're now, um, you know, kind of moved beyond a, a certain threshold where uh, this, this universal adoption is, is coming a step closer. So Brian, on that note, um, M1, just, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe you do any trading of cryptocurrencies currently yet. Uh, I mean, where do you see the future of trading platforms like yours um, embracing the, the, trading, the trading of these of these assets? And then 
Um, how far are we from that just being normal? Um, I think there's, I don't know, two, two reasons for that. One is just a bandwidth issue uh, that we, you know, we do brokerage, we do banking, we do payments, and, and uh, it's just a <laughs> uh, you know, bit like are, are chewing a lot in, in terms of the platform that we've created to date. And there's a ton of people doing a ton of like brilliant things in crypto. And I think when we go into something, we look to how can we improve it, not just do a sort of me too type solution. Um, right. the, the other thing, like I, I'm by no means a crypto expert. And so I'm, I'm you know, the, like not, not the person to talk to here. I do. There are some times where it's a question of whether what we're solving for is a tech innovation or a sort of like regulatory arbitrage uh, type opportunity that, you know, if you take something like cross-border payments, crypto does a fantastic job at that, but it's something that we could easily solve with existing technology now. It's not a difficult or expensive problem from a technical perspective. What makes it very difficult is the regulatory environment, all the anti-money laundering rules, the uh, regulatory scrutiny and scorn that you get on it. And so, you know, I think that there's a big question of, you know, if the um, regulatory environment were sort of lessened throughout the, the financial service industry, would we use existing technologies or net new technologies? And I think then it would be, you know, a real question of what is the, the best technology to drive the equation uh, or, you know, drive the solution. But it, sometimes I think it's more regulatory in nature than, than technology or operational process driven. And that's one of the advantages that I think Switzerland does have over us is that they can have, I think, a much more open approach. Uh, Joe, so Daniel said price. Brian, uh, who's building a terrific company and focused on a lot of great things, says, you know, this will come eventually. We have tools available. Um, we have the regulatory environment needs to catch up. Um, just because we have such a great panel of people with backgrounds in trading and crypto and traditional investment assets. What's your thoughts on the impact of these, of the changing options that the individual consumer has um, when it comes to financial health? So um, asked more simply, should I be teaching my son how to uh, create his own pick your cryptocurrency account and manage it? The same way you'd, the same way the United States conventionally teaches kids to manage diversified investment accounts. Yeah, well, if, if the United States actually had a education framework that taught about investments, I think we'd probably be in a much better place, unfortunately. Um, and I think this is probably the, the biggest takeaway is, you know, the, the financial knowledge that the average American has is actually significantly lower uh, than is required to participate in what would be deemed uh, sophisticated investments and unfortunately, that entry level for a definition of sophisticated is a mutual fund, an exchange traded fund, or how to purchase an individual security. And so if we go up the complexity ladder, you know, we are very far away, away from having hundreds of millions of Americans not only understand, but be financially ready to have things like uh, cryptocurrency. And unfortunately, given the paucity of education, that might be a little premature for a lot of people. And it might be uh, sort of like asking somebody to wield a jackhammer as a 12 year old, right? It'd be dangerous, even though if you're trained in using a jackhammer, it could be a very powerful tool to affect you know, your, your end goals. So it's, it's not that it's a pessimistic comment necessarily, it's just that the opportunity to bring more people to a greater level of understanding and ability to use these things is pretty significant in the next 20 years. So, I mean, I'm just picturing my nine-year-old, very eager to play with the jackhammer. Um, there are risks associated with it, right? Unfortunately. Daniel, uh, I think that my question then has to go towards the fact of if cryptocurrency is a highly complex uh, currency, then how do we get, how do we change that so that it's, because I mean, there is a view, a very common view that cryptocurrency is, the, uh, Bitcoin is like a dollar. And so how, how do we bridge that, ed that education gap in terms of where the market is today and how you see it? And you're on mute. 
for the question for your 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 your, uh, your children, you should definitely teach them how to do it, right? Uh, because it will also force you to learn exactly how it works, right? Um, um, but I think uh, more broader, I mean, some of these changes sometimes happen seismically, right? As in, you know, a plane, a whole plane shifts, and all of a sudden, it, there's just a new way of doing things. Um, and, um, you know, th that's, that's when it gets really interesting. And, and we saw, I mean, you know, unthinkable scenarios happening all the time, right? Um, you know, who would have thought that um, COVID-19 would, 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 would knock so many com companies into a digital transformation because they just simply had to, they couldn't figure out how to work otherwise. Um, you know, who would have thought that, you know, airline and airport travel to conventions would die down the way it did and, and you know, how we could recover from it. And, and all of a sudden these things become normal very quickly. And I think that's the real danger. And that's what we, when we go to the banks here, you know, many also say, ah, oh, come on, you know, like, look, um, you know, we're just trying to get our people to understand these things, let alone, you know, uh, playing with the devil's toys of cryptocurrency. But um, at the same time, you know, if you're managing people's wealth, um, you just can't ignore asset classes that are outperforming, you know, so consistently over such a long period of time, um, like Bitcoin or like other cryptocurrencies, right? So, and, and, and still be a, a financial advisor. Um, and then big things happen and, and, and a seismic shift occurs and all of a sudden you, you have, you know, like, you know, my grandma coming along and saying, oh, by the way, you know, I like this new Trezor wallet because it's, uh, it's got a, you know, a multi-party computational key on it, right? And you're just like, what? <laughs> um, but I think that that'll come faster than you expect it to. And it'll take things like hyperinflation or, or, or other massive revaluation or readjustments and corrections that, that will bring out some of these effects. And I feel like this is a, I'd love to have another 30, 40 minutes to go into this topic because I feel that like this is actually where there's a question around what other seismic events are we going to experience in the next, you know, six, 12, 18 months. Um, you know, Brian, some people might say that the Robin Hood uh, situation was a seismic event for the industry. So, um, but again, I'm going to pause. I'm going to show some discipline on there. I'd love to encourage that to happen offline, either on Twitter. Um, but the question that I have is Ilya, because I think this all leads right back to um, the democratization of access to some of these tools. And one of the questions that we got uh, actually in the group was something as simple as, can a U.S. resident open a U-Hodler account or any other Swiss space institution account? And if so, are there particular terms and stipulations that they must be adhered to? Um, I mean, this so is good. it, right? That's the question. That's the fundamental question okay. that we all dealing with right okay so so uh no unfortunately not so our services is not available uh, are not available for the us users yet just because of regulation now uh, we still have this big issue that financial market works globally but regu but, but it's regulated locally so um so for us uh there are still a lot of things to do in order to enter the us and by the way uh chicago could be a good option why? Because of um, uh, CME, because of Chicago Mercantile Exchange, because their um, Bitcoin options, Ethereum futures recently launched. So you, you guys have a really awesome environment, uh, perfect community there. So a lot of uh, talents. So probably we will consider Chicago as an option to enter the US market and offer our services to the US users. But as of now, no, we are mostly focused on Europe. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I'm looking at the clock and I wanna be super sensitive of everyone's time. I, I, we we're very gracious to the time you took today, um, but I'm gonna end with, uh, you know, I typically you end final thoughts, but I'm gonna blend two questions that are in our Q and A uh, into an opportunity for us to close. Uh, the question is, the questions are related to essentially how can we work more together? How can, what, what traits um, across the globe are important for talent to develop that makes a, make them an attractive choice for you to either partner or work with them. And then the other question was, um, are there still good reasons to expand and enter new markets? And I think we all agree that that's the case today based on these conversations. But um, we go around the horn, what, what do you think, uh, you know, if, if you were advising yourself in today's current environment and you were starting your career, what would you be focused on building in terms of skills to be able to participate in the companies and the organizations that you guys are a part of today? Uh, I'll start with you, Daniel. Um, yeah, um, 
I think a good understanding of um, you know machine learning, AI, um, and uh, and and uh, and digital assets, um, you know, cryptology would would probably be um, the three topics that I that I'd look for with, with a good strong math degree. I think if I had to take my education over, I'd I'd want to have a really strong mathematical foundation. Thank you, Ilya. Uh, yeah, so of course, mathematical and engineering, uh, but in addition to this, I think uh, diplomatic skills. You know why? Because, uh, you know, one of the biggest issues of the modern times is, uh, you know, um, is uh, localization and uh, some political confrontations. So uh, look at the 2020. So how many different local crises we've got during last year? And many of them happened just because of lack of diplomacy. So, uh, so I would say diplomatic skills. <laughs> Very great. Ryan, bring it over to the States. Um, I think you can learn a tremendous host of skills. I mean, at our company, we need marketers, we need operations people, we need engineers, we need product designers, uh, we, we need finance people. Like you need every skill set. The thing that I would say is being uh, very fluent in sort of a tech driven environment is super important. You can just be highly, like significantly more productive using the latest and greatest technology than you can, um, you know, sort of doing it on a person by person one off basis. And so using technology to leverage your skill or craft, I think is the most important thing. I think uh, those three points are so good that I'll take a slightly different way of answering it. Um, I, I think when you're sourcing talent, you know, you, you have three sort of uh, axes upon which to decide. You have speed, you have quality, um, and I had it in my head, you have speed, quality, and cost, right? And so when you're thinking about talent, you have to figure out which of those three components you care about. And one of the beautiful things about a talent, uh, global talent supply is now there are marketplaces like TopTal for software engineering, Dribble for design, et cetera, where as a founder and a builder of a company, you can essentially play with those dials. And then that answer can lead you into different areas of the uh, global economy and talent, right? So if you're trying to get your costs low, maybe you go into some of the markets in Asia. If you're trying to get your uh, talent to be blended with speed, um, and, and quality, maybe you go to Eastern Europe for um, software engineering, but those solutions are becoming more accessible via these marketplaces, which is incredibly exciting. I think as a small startup, we've still, we've already outsourced talent to over 10 countries. Um, and I imagine that number will continue to grow. Great. Well, um, a tremendous thank you to all of you. Uh, this conversation has been, you've made it easy because you've had the talent and experience and the perspective. So uh, I can't say that um, I, I, but I can't imagine a better time I would have had this morning with, with this panel. So thank you so much. Uh, I, I hear I also took some notes, Ilya and Daniel, because there's probably some opportunities for us to collaborate on a more deeper level um, with some of the, some of the, so, so introducing you to some of our partners here in the Chicago market. Um, and Brian and Joe, I'm sure vice versa, there's probably some notes of ways that they can uh, share some learnings across uh, and, in Switzerland. So Kyle, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to moderate this panel. They made it super easy. Randy, thank you, my friend. You did a tremendous job. And I'd just like to thank Daniel, Ilya, Joe, and Brian for just the informative. That was the fastest session we've had. WBC's done about nine of these since the pandemic. And that was the most engaging and thorough conversation. So thank each of you. And I'd also like to recognize the Council General here in Chicago from Switzerland for his support, partnership, and helping to facilitate this conversation today. Um, this has been a, I, the nature of global finance will continue to change as our panelists discussed and looked. And so Global Business Chicago, our friends at the Swiss Consulate, will continue to organize these type of conversations to bring us together, to flatten the globe, as Randy said a little while ago, and strengthen our connections so that our worlds are a little more connected and our commerce and our partnerships and our friendship are strengthened. If there's anything that we can do at World Business Chicago or through our Chicago sister cities with Laurent, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. And thank you all so much for giving up a part of your Tuesday morning 
or Tuesday afternoon or Tuesday evening if you were over in Asia joining us to be part of this conversation. Thank you. Have a wonderful Tuesday and look forward to having you join our next conversation. Hey, Kyle, quick question. Are we going to be recording this? Yep, there will be the a recording. Yep, there will be a recording, thank you, Randy, that we will have up in a day or so on our YouTube page and we'll send out in a thank you note uh, later this week.